All right, welcome to the uh, July 10th and on Creds V2 working group meeting. A um, couple of topics for today, main one being um, revocation requirements and um, for, trying to get to a formal definition uh, that can be put in a paper of what the revocation requirements are. So this is um, a chance to talk through those. And then um, the goal is to lead to a formal document that we produce um, that outlines um, the requirements of revocation. Um, since it seems to be the trickiest part of all that we're doing. Um, reminder that this um, specification is under the community specification license. So if you're going to work on it, uh, make sure you're aware of the requirements of that. It's kind of like the um, Apache for uh, not for open source, but rather for open specifications. Um, this is a Linux Foundation Hyperledger Foundation mu uh, meeting. So the Linux Foundation antitrust policy is in effect, as is the Hyperledger Code of Conduct. Um, I'll share in the chat the link to the... Uh, whoops, that's not it. That's not it at all. And hopefully you... Hey, I can delete a message. Whoa, cool. Um, anyway, the, uh, this uh, document is here. I want to shift into edit mode for it. But um, if anyone wants to add their name to the attendees, please do so. And um, help with the note taking. That would be great. Um, if anyone is new to the community and wants to introduce themselves and what their interest in this is, that would be good to have done now. So grab the microphone. Hey all, my name is uh, Ashley. I'm uh, new to the group. Um, just trying to get my feet wet a little bit and get my uh, uh, think, get my understanding oriented towards what what uh, what you're doing with the non cred So um, just kind of interested in listening in today and and uh, seeing what it's all about. And hopefully we'll be able to contribute down the road. Awesome. Welcome, Ashley. Good to see you. Hope you are Likewise. well. All right, um, I wanna get into a presentation discussion on what we need for revocation. That's the, the big topic for the day. Um, so let me uh, share a presentation that I've got. Um, share, copy the link. I'll put that also into the chat. Um, so this is the presentation I'm using. Um, as I say, looking for feedback on this, um, whoops, what we're trying to get to is uh, an academic paper or style um, that outlines the, the revocation requirements in a formal way. Um, we're getting a bit of pushback uh, from the academic community in, in looking at some of the revocation methods that we are talking about. And part of that is they just don't feel like we've uh, got enough in the formal definition stage. So that's what the goal is coming out of this. So problem statement, um, we need to replace the insufficiently scalable and on creds V1 revocation scheme as soon as possible. So that's um, the main thing we're trying to accomplish. Um, Revocation being a requirement of pretty much all use cases for verifiable credentials. There's some that don't need it, but but most do, even if um, even if it's not understood at the time uh, you get started. Even if um, the only reason you need revocation is because you issued a credential by mistake and you need to correct that, um, that's a requirement for having revocation. And and so almost every use case. Um, for verifiable credentials includes revocation. Um, expiry dates in verifiable credentials are crucial and, and are recommended, but are insufficient for um, revocation. If, if there's any sort of um, pseudo real-time need for revocation, it has to, um, it has to be available. Um, it has to be part of the revocation scheme and expiration isn't good enough or generally not good enough. Um, expiration is, is well, we'll go from there. Um, 
The dog wants in, so I have to open the door. Don't worry about that. Okay, participants. So uh, replication options, I'm gonna go through a set of options, but do that by going through the participants, the attributes and trade-offs, and then look at the options we've got. So participants, generally people know these, issuers, holders, and verifiers. Anyone who knows anything about verifiable credentials knows those. Um, revocation manager is a, a new um, participant from time to time. A revocation manager is someone who provides information about revocation in some form. Um, in some of the schemes we've got, they're formally called revocation managers. Um, others, um, they, they just hold and provide the data necessary. Um, the data sources are, include revocation manager. So where you get revocation manager, um, issuers publish revocation data, holders retrieve, generally holders retrieve that information and generate a proof. Verifiers also generally retrieve revocation information and they verify the proof from the holder. So that's the common model. There's a couple of variations that we're gonna see. So it's not always that. Um, but that revocation data source, um, where the information that gets published by the issuer appears can be in a couple of places. So verifiable data registry, e.g. ledgers or um, you know, places where DIDs reside. Ideally, it would be passive, meaning that the verifiable data registry itself does not dynamically need to generate revocation data. It is just static data that it serves out. So just like a DID doc um, is a static document that is returned when a DID is resolved, it would be nice if revocation data were static data and could be returned as, as is uh, from a registry. And, and the reason for that is it reduces the um, capability necessary for the registry. Um, an example is Hyperledger Indy, which dynamically generates requested data. So um, Indy knows about an on-cres revocation register. They're not just some static data that gets published on an Indy ledger, but rather um, Indy knows about them and accepts specialized requests to return, specifically for returning um, the deltas the, the change statuses of various credentials. So instead of getting the entire state from Indy, you get um, a list of the credentials whose status has changed since you previously asked for it, whether that's from the beginning of time or from some point in time where you previously asked. So that that's, is an example. That's a potential privacy issue. Yep, exactly. Um, and and it and it adds an additional requirement on the ledger to say, oh, I need to be able to do that. So in in an OnCreds v1 um, that we've implemented, we've basically taken off that as a requirement that while Indy can do that, other um, other uh, ledgers can simply return the full state of all credentials and not ask for uh, a point in time or, or anything. So when they get the state of, uh, you know, a given state of the, of the credential status, they get all of them. Um, so that's a way to turn it into being passive. Um, revocation managers are proposed for some schemes. Basically they are an active server that responds to a request from, from perhaps an issuer to get revocation information. Um, the response is dependent on the type of scheme. So one example is um, a thing called uh, linked verifiable, blah, 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 I'm not remembering, LVVM that we're going to talk about through this. Um, basically, the issuer asks a revocation manager, give me a proof of non-revocation of my credential as of now. And the revocation manager simply issues a verifiable credential and a non-creds verifiable credential that is in the same format as the primary credential. But the purpose of that verifiable credential is to prove non-revocation. And so that's one method of, of doing 
uh, of a revocation manager operating. And there's other ones as well. Allosaur in its implementation has revocation managers as well. Generally, revocation managers um, share or, or provided information from the issuer, and then they um, share that information. And again, last one, file servers is really the same as verifiable data registry. Um, if it's a file server, then it truly must be passive. So it provides only static files, not server generated responses. So where a revocation manager responds to a specific request, um, a file server is simply providing um, a state object, essentially a static, uh, static file that was issued to it, perhaps likely from the um, uh, issuer. So those are the participants in the process. So the basics. Um, a revocation state of all credentials is public, published periodically by the issuer. Um, so the issuer keeps track of every credential it issues. When it wants to um, revoke a credential or a batch of credential, it publishes a state update where it shares either uh, uh, either the deltas of what it's changed recently since its last update, or it simply shares the entire state of all the credentials. And that gets published periodically to whatever is the appropriate place for the given scheme that's being used. Um, when presenting a proof derived from a revocable credential, the holder provides proof that their credential is not revoked based on a specific revocation state. So the issuer has published a bunch of revocation states. The holder gets one of those. And if their credential is um, not revoked, they are able to produce a, a proof that their credential is not revoked. Um, the security guarantee we're looking for, the, the, what we're interested in is that the holder cannot provide a non-revocation proof based on a published revocation state in which the holder's credential is marked revoked. Um, it would be nice to have, so that's that's the what we're aiming for. It would be nice to have that a holder can create a non-revocation proof for a given time in the past. So the use case is, um, you know, a car accident occurred on in 2020, and the holder could produce a non-revocation proof that at the time of the crash back in 2020, their credential had not been revoked, even if it had been revoked later. So that's a nice to have. Um, proof, uh, a credential is not revoked, must be li linked to the credential to which it applies. So uh, a, a given um, proof of non-revocation for a, a primary credential cannot be used um, can only be used for the credential to which it applies. So there must be a linkage between um, the proof of non-revocation and the credential uh, about which it is talking. And finally, there must be an unlimited number of credentials per credential type. So there must be no um, set limit on how many credentials can be issued. Um, uh, if a revocation registry size, so if you do have a limitation on the size of a registry, a revocation registry, there must be a way to have multiple registries so you can just create a new one and continue to issue the same type of credential um, that had been that, that you've been issuing just using a different revocation registry. Jump in anytime if I'm not being clear, as I say, I'm trying to get this to be a lead to a formal document that outlines all of these things. So help in, in making sure I'm getting that down um, would be useful. So we want in a, in a zero knowledge proof based system, unlinkable identifier. So no linkable identifier is given to the verifier. Um, the goal is to prevent correlation across verifiers and between verifiers and the issuer. So when a um, when proof of a of revocation is given to a verifier, you given to multiple verifiers, you don't want a way for those verifiers to um, 
compare a, a unique identifier across each of those so they can correlate or or with the issuer so that they can report to the issuer when a credential gets used. Um, there generally are two um, IDs that are involved. So one is the revocation registry ID itself. So where the revocation is tracked and it is okay to share that or it should be okay to share that. And I'll get to that next. The second is the actual revocation ID. Um, and this is a, a loose term because generally it's a, it's a concatenated key, if you will. Generally it's the revocation registry ID and the index within that registry of the particular credential um, for a particular credential. It is not okay to share this uh, revocation ID. That would be a unique identifier for the credential itself. Um, it is okay to share the revocation registry ID and often necessary so that the uh, verifier can verify the, uh, can verify the uh, proof provided. Um, the revocation ID itself is commonly shared between the issuer and the holder. It is not shared with the verifier. So that's the limitation there. Um, the registry size must be large enough to hide in the crowd. Hey, uh, Stephen, yeah. what about a revocation registry public key? Can that be, I mean, obviously not yeah. every revocation registry needs it, but okay. can it be optional? Yeah. Okay. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. We'll add a note on that. Because some accumulators use them, some accumulators don't, but you might like, let's say you're on a file server, you might have the public key used to verify a signature over a revocation yeah. set. Yeah, I guess we could say public parameters that are unique to the, the registry. Yeah. yeah. So like maybe instead of revocation, well, revocation ID is fine. Uh, registry ID is fine. I'm just talking about like, like, yeah, public parameters for that revocation registry. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, revocation registry size must be large enough to hide in the crowd. So the idea here is, um, suppose I have two credentials that are revocable. I share them, I present them together and in doing that, I provide a revocation registry ID for each of them. But since the registration, uh, the rev regs themselves are so small, um, basically that the, the chances of somebody being in those particular two revocation registries is uh, uh, unlikely and hence you get what amounts to a linkable identifier. So this is the current problem we have in on, with an on-creds one. You inadvertently um, wind up sharing a unique credential because um, of sharing uh, multiple revocable credentials together. And so the suggestion that I've heard of, <clears throat> and maybe I just made it up, was um, at least a million credentials needed within a replication registry to prevent this uh, this uh, uh, to prevent this uh, kind of linkability. And obviously, if there's only if it's a single credential uh, uh, with a registry uh, a population smaller than the replication registry, that's fine. There would only be one replication registry for that entire credential. This one is probably the loosest requirement. I'm not quite sure how to say it any better than that. So um, hopefully that's clear. This is the one that I didn't realize for quite a long time was this, this issue. Um, once a verifier has received a proof of non-revocation, the verifier must not be able to see changes to the revocation status of that credential. So this is a complaint that I see, or and I certainly make with the revocation list 2021, which is uh, a non-ZKP to begin with. But basically, once a, a holder shares their identifier for their credential to the verifier, the verifier can go on monitoring the um, revocation status and see if in the future 
the credential gets uh, gets um, revoked, which is um, could be a feature in, <clears throat> in some people's view, but I, I see it as a, a consent issue that you're actually not giving, you don't want to give the verifier ongoing ability to track your um, revocation status. Yeah. Linkability <clears throat> can also be looked at from a calling home perspective. So nice to have and perhaps required in some cases is to avoid calling home during presentation. So calling home is where the issuer or, or sorry the holder or the verifier or both have to call back to for example the issuer to be able to retrieve the information necessary to do a presentation and the issue there is basically web logs can be used to track holders and verifiers and track what they're doing and the correlation between them so nice to have and in some cases required, avoid the user being able to track when a holder is doing a presentation, avoid a user being able to track both the holder and the verifier during presentation. And, and the problem there is a holder gets revoc revocation data from the issuer to create a presentation. And then immediately afterwards, the verifier calls the issuer to verify that presentation. And now the issuer can correlate that the holder used their credential and the verifier with which with whom they used it. And that's that's what we want to avoid. Um, even the perception of calling home is a problem for government. So, for example, if I every time I used my person credential to prove my age, um, there was a web call made to a uh, gov.bc.ca you know, domain, a, a government of British Columbia domain, even if th there wasn't data being tracked, this perception of calling home is problematic. So, um, and that could just be the rejection of the use of the mechanism, uh, 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 basically a viral, um, we won't use this because it's, it's um, government tracking. Um, Call home assessments must be considered based on the likelihood of collusion. So um, the revocation manager idea can be considered a call home, even if the issuer and the revocation managers are different parties. So that is something that needs to be looked at as well. Uh, and even, um, for example, in, in Canada, um, where the revocation information is going on in Indy Ledger. That ledger is actually operated by a, a different government entity, but it's still government entities or, or sorry, entities. And um, so there is a call being made, which may offend holders and, and may develop mistrust in the system because even though it's going to a ledger, which is in theory a neutral party, um, there is the possibility of tracking. Now, again, it's all a, a range of, of um, gray in this. So uh, it's not always clear exactly where this problem needs to be prevented. I mean, you've got to get the data from somewhere, um, but there's better, uh, some places are better than others is the idea. Um, I'll, <clears throat> I'll do an aside on this that uh, an idea came up recently where um, the verifier provides revocation data to the holder. So the verifier is the one that reaches out to wherever the data is, is kept. And then the verifier provides that revocation data to the holder. Um, that's an interesting idea that I've been exploring a bit um, to try to eliminate this call home from the holder. Um, it does require, in some cases, an extra back and forth between the verifier and the holder, but it does mean that the holder is only interacting with the verifier, and that's it. Um, been looking at a paper from Andreas uh, Freitag based on a diff survey he did that talks about issuer holder privacy um, and issuer verifier privacy. So this is the issuer holder. 
Um, so this formalizes a little bit. The issuer gets no information about the usage of the VC and the verifier and or the verifier involved. Um, Semi-private, the issuer gets information that the VC is used from the holder um, and or gets information that a verifier is performing a validation process. So one or the other. And, the, and then the no privacy is where the issuer knows the VC, the holder, and the verifier used in the validation process. So obviously, the higher we are on this scale, the better. Um, this is likewise <clears throat> from the same paper, um, holder verifier privacy. So full privacy, semi-privacy, and no privacy. Um, uh, you can see those definitions. So those might be useful in the paper we use, uh, we're creating, um, so we can use those descriptions. Um, I, sorry, just looking at the last slide, of course, there, there's always a risk because um, the verifier knows who the issuer is. They yeah. can They can tell the issuer that a verification is happening. They might not be yeah. able to tell them who the holder is exactly. Um, although most of the time they they will have one or more attributes to report right. back. Not based on the fact that a presentation was given, but based on what was presented in the credential. Yeah. Yeah. I think you can always do that. I mean, be yeah. careful not miscommunicating that. You can always, of course, if you know the issuer, which you're going to have to um, yeah. report back. But it, it's it's important that to achieve the verification required, that you're not systematically required to. Yep. Yeah. Um, com computing capability. So basically. <clears throat> Assumptions that, that I've seen lately assume issuer and revocation managers are enterprise apps, so they have pretty powerful systems, lots of storage. Um, you know, an issuer must track all the issuances, unilaterally revokes them, and, pu and publishes revocation as necessary, either as the revocations happen or in batches. Um, our assumption has always been pretty much that the holder is a mobile wallet. Um, in the worst case, um, should not have to download substantial files during a presentation. Presentation time, generation time should be short. And I've actually got numbers on the next screen about that based on Andreas's work. And then <clears throat> this is a bit of a new one. Um, usually we think of verifiers as enterprise apps as well, um, but we're actually doing a fair amount in uh, verifiers being mobile apps, um, uh, where, uh, you know, a, a, a mobile verifier could, could, you know, display a QR code, scan it by the holder mobile app, and the two of them just um, trade a, a presentation, and the verifier would have to be able to do it. So again, if we, if we go with the lowest common denominator, this is a reasonable requirement. Um, should not have to download substantial files. Verifier time should be short. Um, this is the um, uh, from a paper that Andreas did, again, based on the DIFF survey. This is what the survey participants said. They sort of view um, issuers and verifiers, in this case, as enterprise holders, as uh, wallets. They've got a tighter bound on the size of the data that the holder should have to, you know, retrieve and, and use on their device. Um, and the computational time, nobody really cares about the issuer. Um, they can throw more metal at it, so that's okay. We want it to be within a second um, for the most uh, of the respondents to the survey and a tenth of a second for verifiers. So they want them to be very fast. So those are um, higher numbers. Um, this really fits with the um, call home. I should probably get rid of this slide. Um, 
this is really to, to do with calling home that the holders and verifiers collect the data from dis different sources. They do it from other than the issuer because of the call home issue and perceptively independent. So really is the same issue. Um, this is an extra one, um, which this requirement stems from the idea that um, <clears throat> when issuing a credential, you may want to sign the credential with a non-creds signature, but you also might want to sign it with a NIST signature. Um, in that case, if you also want to support revocation, it would be nice not to have two different revocation schemes having to be kept in sync. Um, so if a relatively simple bit array technique similar to status list 2021 was available, it could be used for the NIST um, purpose, um, but also used for an non-creds purpose. So that's uh, you know another reason, uh, a, a nice a nice to have alignment. Um, that is looking like a possibility down the line of having uh, a credential signed with two different signatures and then and for them to be used by the two different uh, those two different signatures to be used by verifiers um, depending on their needs. So that is a possibility coming down. Um, these are the this gets into finally the four schemes that we've um, looked at, you know, on creds 1.0. Alasor, um, LVBC, which is the one that um, Andreas um, produced, and then finally ZK Sam, the signed accumulator membership. Um, so papers are linked to all of these. As I said, this this presentation is more about um, less about the solution, more about the different um, uh, how to how to formalize what the requirements are. But this sort of shows where the uh, anon creds basically falls apart, can't be used. Um, a, a benefit from ZK SAM um, of it having a bit array type um, data scheme, um, the size of the file being much much larger, but still not massive in the ZK SAM, but much larger than the other schemes. Um, the call home or perception of call home is in both of the Alasor and LVVM approaches. So yellows for well, them. Maybe you have a clarification, like Alasor doesn't necessarily need to call home every time you present. Yes. And when it calls home, it's anonymous. Yeah. And that's why I've got in here revocation managers. They are dynamic. The revocation manager is a dynamic service that must be available, right? Yes, that's. So that's the summary. Um, any Anything I've missed there? And Mike, in particular, do you see anything that would contribute to a paper? So what I'm thinking of doing, um, if I go back here, uh, Andreas has uh, a section um, that that basically uses the survey as the, what are the, scheme so i'm sort of taking some of that from his but less survey based and talking about the the things that are in my in, in that presentation as the way to present here are requirements seem reasonable yeah i think for the most part um maybe i don't know how to add this if it does call home, is there a way to say it's required to be anonymous? Yes. Yeah. So the other requirement, and I don't know where to put this either, and maybe you already covered it, is the the inability of folks to de like the issuers or revocation manager to determine when was the last time they 
updated. Like if they have to call home, then they can't determine whether they last called home like a year ago or just a month ago or yesterday. Because hmm. uh, that was one of the requirements we had in Alistair was to was to solve that. Yeah, I, I wanted to check to the, the Alistair update protocol. Does that mean that the revocation manager doesn't know what index they're updating? That's right. They do not. Okay. And how do even they if know? they, how do they not know? How do they not know the last time updated? I thought they basically that was what you did. You call back and said the last time I updated was now. When did you update well, me? The again? holder knows. The holder knows, but the revocation manager doesn't. That was the whole idea behind Alisor was to fix that problem. Because because uh, one of the methods of tracking is uh, like you said earlier. When was the last time they updated or last time they phoned home? Like, so Alisor mitigates all of that. And how does it do that? What do you, what do you request when you call, when you call to the revocation manager in Alisor? Uh, in a nutshell, a little more complicated than this, but in a nutshell, basically I split my share or my uh, revocation ID into multiple secret shares as many yeah. as I want, say like first time I could do five of 10, next time I could do seven of 20, it doesn't matter. And yeah. I contact the vacation manager that many times that maybe it's all at the same time, maybe it's at different times, it doesn't matter. And then I can, I alone can obviously re-aggregate those, but they're all anonymous. So the revocation manager can't determine whether one request is the same user or a different user because they're all the same. And it's also resistant to like, let's say even if an attacker tries to request for something, let's say he doesn't know my revocation ID, or maybe he does. He's gonna he requests an update for it, unless he had a valid witness at any point in time, unless he unless he has one, that response back is completely useless. So think of it as like a, that witness is a signature. If he yeah. never had the signature to begin with then his result is useless. So even if a bad guy asks for all the data, his result is useless. Okay. But so you, the the holder still says, oh, I last updated on June 20th, right? It's just they can Yeah, well the holder the holder the holder will know that, right? The holder has to know when they last updated. Actually, they don't even care. They only care, do I have a valid witness for what the, can I present a proof that's valid for what the verifier wants? Okay. I'm, I'm saying, does the holder specifically pass to the revocation manager June 20th? Because that was the last time they updated or they just say. Nope. No, no, they just say, I need, I need a version for this one. That's it. So. They could, they could say like, yeah, let's say each revocation registry was tagged by a date. He could say, yeah, I need one that's valid as of June, July 20th or something like that. He could. Oh, I see. But the, the cryptography doesn't matter. The cryptography, the, the pro, as, as uh, Nathan George always says, the protocol does not betray you. <laughs> it's the metadata that would. Yeah, yes. So, so if the revocation manager was just saying, here's my versions of the accumulator, and if someone said, I just want the latest, then they don't know when they last updated. Mm -hmm. Or actually, they don't even know when they last updated. They just know which one they're, which version they're requesting. That's it. They learn nothing else. Okay. And, and then, and the way you do that is you split the key. If you don't split the key, do they know who you are? Uh, well, that's, a, yeah, that's equivalent to spending the full thing. So yeah, they would see it. Okay. Well, actually it's a commitment, so they really wouldn't. You could say, hey, this is one of one, but the protocol would still hide it. My gosh, Oliver, what do you need? Okay.
Sorry, my kids are asking me lots of questions. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? All right. Well, so do we like, do you want to add like a section on calling home private? Because I don't think calling home is entirely bad in every exactly. case. Yes. And that's why it's. Sorry, I lost you there. I was just saying the perception could be that it's bad, but. I don't know, like calling home isn't always bad, but it could be a yellow flag if it's done wrong. It's a red flag if it's definitely done wrong. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yep. So um, one of the ways, evidently, Gen Digital did the linked validity verifiable credentials. What they do is um, they provide a list of essentially revocation managers and you can call to any of them and you basically pass an ID to them and then you get back uh, a, a proof of non-revocation that's linked to the credential you've got. So it's got to use the same, uh, it's got to be linked somehow to the, um, to the credential, but um, you could use different managers and the Verifier has to know which are the trusted managers to get that that from. So they've got a technique to do that. But that would be considered in the calling home. How how safe is it? How good is it? And is it every time or is it just once per any time the registry changes? Um <laughs> That's that would question. be important to call out because if it's like every time or just once, because like Alistair, for example, the only time you have to call home is any time the registry changes. Yeah. Otherwise, you never have to call home. Yeah, I, I would think um, it would depend on the verifier because the verifier doesn't know how often it changes. Well, yeah, the verifier wouldn't even know in that in that because there's no accumulator or anything for it to collect. It just got to know. It just got to know if the if the uh, if the credential is valid or not, so they wouldn't know when it changes. So they would do it more like ba based on how recent it was. How recently did you ch you get a a get a non revocation credential? Okay. Um, the other topic I wanted to go through, so we'll leave it for there. I'm going to try to get that right up done. Um, the other topic I wanted to do, Mike, um, was in in schema claim type. You've um, you've listed a, a series of claim types. I wonder if um, I, I wondered in doing that um, whether the way that a piece of data is encoded is a useful claim type and in particular around dates. If I could have an ISO 860 date type or an ISO 860 date time type, the encoding of that could be into the integer date form or the Unix time form. That would be helpful. Um, do you see that as a useful, is that what you were thinking schema claim types could be used for? Do you think that was useful? I don't, Mostly, I don't, yeah. So like when I said there's a number type, you can obviously be more specific, yes. right? And you can create subsets. So yeah, obviously date, date times, date since 1900. I mean, there's all sorts of different times or numbers that you could represent with that. Sure. Yes. Okay. So it would make sense to put it in the spec that we, since we're going to have claim types anyway, having these two would be particularly useful so that the data could be provided yep. in ISO 860, but um, be useful for ZKPs for, for predicates. That's right. And then whether you want to support negative numbers or not. Right. Yeah. That's, that's built into what you've already got because you've got that zero centering. Correct. But if you don't need zero centering, then um, like some things don't make sense. Like when did this happen? You know, yes. 
within yeah. the century, for example. Yeah. Okay, well, that was quick and easy. All right, I want to get that into that use. All right, um, those are the topics I had for now. As I say, the next chunk of work, I think, for the, the 2.0, is to um and and in on creds in general is to get a a more formal definition of what the revocation requirements are suitable for cryptographers to use in evaluating schemes um and then to try to get those schemes um some evaluation done on those schemes to try to get um contributions from some cryptographers on the various places on the various schemes where we want to use where needed That's all I had. Any other comments, questions, discussion points? Something to maybe add to non-creds too is <clears throat> just as we're doing with revocation requirements, mm -hmm. uh, credential signature requirements. Mm -hmm. NIST or not, SNARK allowed or not, you know, basically. Can you say the signature is NIST approved, but the ZKP is not approved? Because most ZKPs, I don't know of any exception or that are NIST approved. Okay. I think the path that we're most likely going down is that in addition to an non cred signature, you can put a NIST signature on it, but you lose all of the capabilities. Uh, a proof can still be be created about the about the credential, but the and on creds capabilities go away essentially. All right, that's it for today's meeting. Thanks all for attending. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with some new topics to go over and hopefully some new, uh, get to some documents. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Take care all. See ya. Thanks.